of the workplace as a bargaining Order. tactic. Senator Urquhart, it being 2 p.m., we'll move to questions without notice. Senator, Ken I'm going to ask for Senator Keneally will be having the first question remotely, so I'll ask for quiet. Senator Keneally. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. In an article in this Sydney Morning Herald entitled New South Wales Pharmacists Stuck in Waiting Game for Vaccines, Mario Baroni, a pharmacist in Western Sydney's hotspot suburb of Fairfield, reported that despite placing a second order for AstraZeneca doses on Monday, the vaccines won't arrive for nearly three weeks. He says, and I quote, these vaccines are in a fridge somewhere, but they aren't in pharmacy fridges. Given there have been tragically five more deaths from COVID-19 recorded in New South Wales today, why are pharmacists in the hot spot of Fairfield waiting almost three weeks for AstraZeneca vaccines to arrive? Minister representing the Minister for Health remotely, Senator Colbeck. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, uh, as pharmacies uh, undertake their onboarding process for uh, delivery of uh, vaccines through the National Vaccination Program, uh, there is a process of onboarding registration and ordering of vaccines, Mr. President. Uh, there, there is a cycle uh, of assessment of that process, uh, of preparing the um, pharmacists to ensure that the appropriate training has been undertaken so that the vaccines are handled appropriately and administered as they should be, Mr. President. And we have seen in the past the circumstances where, fortunately, uh, appropriate uh, training, and that's led to mistakes. So there are processes, Mr. President, where, uh, as a part of the onboarding process, the uh, pharmacists uh, are registered, uh, that go through a process of assessment. Uh, and training, uh, and, and as, uh, while that process is being undertaken, uh, their orders are, uh, are taken from them and uh, deliveries are processed, Mr. President. So it does take a couple of weeks to onboard a, uh, a pharmacist into the system, uh, but that's done deliberately so that we can ensure that the vaccination process is undertaken uh, safely. Uh, and in accordance with the appropriate processes of delivery of the vaccine to the Australian community. Senator Keneally, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Port Macquarie-based pharmacist Judy Plunkett says she's yet to receive a single vaccine dose and has said, and I quote, if pharmacies were brought on in April, we could have done tens of thousands of doses by now. Every barrier has been put in front of us. Why are pharmacists who want to vaccinate Australians against COVID-19, having every barrier put in front of them. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. And I completely reject the premise of Senator Keneally's question. Uh, it's always been part of our national plan to progressively increase the number of outlets that uh, the coronavirus vaccines were available at. Uh, we started uh, with the state clinics, the Commonwealth vaccination clinics, uh, then we brought on GPs, and as vaccine uh, availability increased, uh, the plan was always to progressively bring on pharmacy. And that's exactly what we've done, Mr. President. Mr. President, uh, I reject the comment that we've put barriers in front of uh, pharmacy. Uh, we have progressively built the vaccine supply and the number of outlets to ensure that Australians could get access to a vaccine wherever they are around the country, but to ensure that that is done safely, uh, progressively, so that we can meet our objective of providing everyone who wants a vaccine one by the end of the year. Order. Senator Keneally, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. The Pharmacy Guild of Australia's New South Wales branch has criticised the Morrison government's decision to contract logistics out separately, instead of using the community service obligation wholesaler network which would have used existing cold chain supplies to ensure 24-hour delivery. Does the Morrison government take responsibility for the failed logistics arrangements which are delaying vital COVID vaccines to New South Wales? Senator Colbeck. Well, again, Mr. President, I don't accept the premise 
that Senator Keneally has placed on the uh, on, in her question. Mr. President, all throughout this process, we've put in place systems and measures to ensure the safe delivery uh, and distribution of the coronavirus vaccines. They are um, have to be managed in a particular way. They have to be managed in accordance with appropriate cold storage, Mr. President. And so it has been uh, an unprecedented, an unprecedented logistical exercise to ensure the distribution of the vaccine, Mr. President. Uh, and we have across the country successfully delivered vaccines to thousands of individual outlets for the coronavirus vaccine, Mr. President. And we will continue to ensure that we safely uh, and properly ensure, uh, get those deliveries out Order. to all Senator of the outlets Colbeck. that require Senator it. Dean Smith. Thank you very much, Mr. President. My question is to the minister representing Indigenous Australians, Senator Rustin. Can the minister advise the Senate how the Commonwealth's Closing the Gap implementation plan announced today will lead to better outcomes for Indigenous Australians across Australia. The Minister representing the Minister for Indigenous Australians, Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President, and thank Senator Smith for his question on this very important topic. Firstly, can I acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on which we meet today, the Ngunnawal people, uh, and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. I also pay uh, particularly I would like to acknowledge Senators McCarthy, Dodson, Lambie and Thorpe in this place. The release today of the Commonwealth Closing the Gap Plan is a really significant milestone um, in achieving the targets of the National Agreement on Closing the Gap, which came into effect last year. With the release of the plan, we are committing more than $1 billion in new measures to support the achievement of closing the gap measures. And we're turning our commitments made under the National Agreement into practical and real actions. This plan is about real reconciliation, how we get there and making sure all governments are held to account, state and federal. So whether it be delivering new health clinics and housing for health professionals to close the gap in relation to life expectancy, or initiatives to lift participation of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children in quality and culturally appropriate early childhood education and care services, or whether it's delivering the Territory's Stolen Generation Redress Scheme, which supports healing for stolen generation survivors. And we will deliver the Outcomes and Evidence Fund to incentivise evidence-based service delivery and deliver tangible and improved outcomes to support child and family safety. We are providing an additional $254.4 million towards infrastructure and better support Aboriginal community-controlled health organisations so they can continue to do the critical work that they do and have been doing so very successfully over recent years. And we're investing $160 million in new funding to ensure the best start in life for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children through a range of different initiatives. But most importantly, we're doing this together. This plan is co-designed and it will be co-designed delivered. Senator Smith, a supplementary question. Thank you. Can the minister explain for the Senate why working in partnership is important to closing the gap and how this is different to previous approaches? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Um, as part of the, the national agreement on closing the gap, we set out four priority reforms to fundamentally change how governments and Aboriginal and Torres, Torres Strait Islander people work together. The implementation plan that was announced today details how governments will do our part in achieving these reforms. It highlights the real and practical actions to be taken across all areas of government and most importantly, it commits funding to actions that will ensure that we get there. Importantly, all governments will work with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander stakeholders with an increasing level of accountability, transparency and responsibility. This reflects the new model of working together. We'll prioritise investments so that we are all responding to the evidence and doing things that will make the most difference. The Morrison government is committed to working with Indigenous Australians to deliver the outcomes needed to close the gap. Senator Smith, a final supplementary question. Thank you very much. What are the benefits of this new approach under the National Agreement on Closing the Gap? Senator Rustin. Under the new um, National Agreement, we've committed to work in true partnership with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander leaders. 
Like the Commonwealth, all parties are required to develop implementation plans that outline how they, how they will deliver their parts and their commitments under the national agreement. They are required to report on their actions annually, ensuring there is a much greater level of shared accountability than under previous agreements. Increased transparency is built on data, and the Morrison government has already delivered towards this priority reform this year with the release of the Closing the Gap dashboard, and we will continue to deliver on our commitments. The implementation plan is also firmly in line with our continued to commitment to work in genuine partnership with Indigenous Australians in both policy delivery, program and service delivery. The, this commitment to shared decision-making will be embedded in the design, implementation and monitoring of policies and programs to improve life outcomes for all Indigenous Australians. Senator Gallagher. Thank you, Mr President. My question <clears throat> is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. In section 1.1 of the Morrison's fourth vaccine plan released in just two months, the Morrison government lists everyone it blames for the slow COVID-19 vaccine rollout, including ATAGI, Pfizer, AstraZeneca, state and territory governments, vaccination clinics and Australians themselves. How did the Morrison government forget to list itself? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Mr President, um, uh, what a petty question from Senator Gallagher. Um, and what a misrepresent and what a misrepresentation what a misrepresentation of what a misrepresentation Order. of Order. the documents and the facts, Mr. President. The government acknowledges that there have been challenges in relation to the vaccine rollout. We acknowledge that, and we take responsibility for it and for fixing it, Mr. President. And we take responsibility for ensuring that, notwithstanding the challenges that have been had in terms of supply that was forecast to arrive that didn't arrive, notwithstanding changes to health advice. Uh, we continue to push on with ensuring that we have uh, supply growth now and into the future, uh, that we have growth in distribution points now and into the future. Uh, and in doing that, Mr. President, we're in the best position to be able to see continued growth in relation to the vaccine rollout. And the data for the last 24 hours is just out, and some 221,859 Australians turned out in the last 24 hours uh, to receive uh, their latest vaccine doses. That, Mr. President, is yet another daily record set in relation to the vaccine rollout. And I thank each and every one of those Australians who, notwithstanding uh, the negativity or elsewhere, uh, are turning out in record numbers. It has pushed the total number of doses administered across Australia to more than 13 million now, Mr. President. In doing so, it sees uh, the over 70s pass the 80 per cent threshold. That first age cohort who were prioritised under the vaccine rollout. We now have more than 80 per cent of them have managed to achieve uh, the target, and in doing so, uh, we will no doubt see even more push on, even more, of course, getting their second dose as those rates climb uh, and that number grow even further in that age cohort, as it will right across the Australian population. Senator Gallagher, a supplementary question. <clears throat> Mr. President. The reason the initial vaccine rollout has been bungled is the Morrison government's failure to secure adequate supplies. Does Mr Morrison take responsibility for his failure to keep Australians safe? Senator Birmingham. Well, Mr President, uh, the Morrison government procured some 195 million doses before we get to the recent announcements, before we get to the recent announcements in relation to those booster doses that were procured. Now, Mr, Mr. President, Mr President, the government, absolutely, as I said before, accepts responsibility for the rollout, the challenges and fixing it. That's our job as a government. We don't shirk or shy away from doing so. Uh, we are pleased to see that we have increased volume of supply. We're pleased to see that we have increased distribution points able to be brought on progressively as we get that increase in supply. We are particularly pleased to see the way in which Australians are responding in record numbers to the vaccine rollout. Australians responding in ways that don't mean they need $300 payments. They're making it clear they want the vaccine. They're making it clear they want to turn out. And we are supporting them to make sure they have increasing chances to turn out rather than the types of silly policy Order. thought bubbles from Senator those opposite. Birmingham, time for the answers expired. Senator Gallagher, a Thank final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. In June, Mr. Morrison boasted nobody in Australia had died 
uh, from COVID-19 in 2021 and nobody was in intensive care. Mr Hunt boasted it was one of the most extraordinary public health achievements in Australian history. 21 people have tragically died in the New South Wales outbreak and 51 people are now in intensive care. Does Mr Morrison concede he is actually responsible for one of the most extraordinary public health failures? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. No, we don't make that concession. We acknowledge that managing COVID-19, managing a global pandemic remains incredibly challenging. That Australia has, has done far better than the rest of the world in the management of the pandemic. But tragically, 932 Australians have lost their lives uh, from COVID-19. 932 in total. 21 have lost their lives during uh, this New South Wales outbreak. Mr President, our government uh, is determined, though, that Australia will continue to do the best we can in managing the pandemic according to the medical advice that we have. That's why we commissioned the Doherty Institute to undertake the modelling there. It's why we have made sure uh, that we pro progress and advance a plan built upon that advice and evidence. Uh, Australia is not immune from COVID-19, but we are absolutely able, as we have done, to continue to respond to the changing circumstances of the Delta variant, to other challenges thrown at us, but to do so in world-leading ways. Senator, Bim Senator Wish Wilson. President, my question is to Senator Hume, representing the Environment Minister. Minister, Australia has just successfully lobbied a UNESCO World Heritage Committee to vote against the scientific advice provided by the IUCN that the Great Barrier Reef should be listed as in danger. A report from Spanish media overnight quoted Spain's UNESCO ambassador as admitting to striking a deal with Australia that they would support Australia's amendments to have the reef not listed as in danger if Australia backed its attempt to have two Spanish properties added to the UNESCO World Heritage List, despite the committee recommending against this. We have also heard that Australia co-sponsored an amendment to list a site in Saudi Arabia, despite the committee also recommending against this. Minister, can you confirm these reports and detail what other deals were done in the name of your government's political agenda? The Minister representing the Minister for the Environment, Senator Hume. Thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank Senator Wish Wilson for his question, his enduring care of the Great Barrier Reef, which is shared with that of the Morrison government. Um, the Morrison government, in fact, is deeply committed to protecting the World Heritage Great Barrier Reef. The tourism industry, traditional owners, the reef communities, they rely on the Morrison government's commitment to the reef, and we will not let them down. Our world's best management of the reef is acknowledged by many, including the World Heritage Committee, who said in this year's decision on the reef that it commends the State Party, that being Australia, for the strong and continued efforts to create conditions for the implementation of the Reef 2050 long-term sustainability Senator plan. Wilson including... on a point of order. Senator Wish Wilson on a point of order. Point of order on relevance, President. Did, did the government do any deals? to win the UNESCO vote. Senator Wish Wilson, the question had a very lengthy preamble, I appreciate. The minister was addressing the body that made the decision you were questioning about, so I believe the minister is being directly relevant if she's talking about the decision that was made, um, because she's entitled to be directly relevant to all or part of a question, especially when it is lengthy. Senator Hume. Thank you very much, Mr President. So discussions between the members of the committee will always remain private, so we make no apologies no apologies for defending we make no apologies for defending Australia's reputation as the best marine park managers in the world. Mr. President, the, mem the Minister for the Environment has highlighted before that climate change is the most Order serious long-term threat to the health of coral reefs worldwide, and that includes the Great Barrier Reef. It also threatens 82 other World Heritage sites around the world. Rainforests, fjordlands, glaciers, none would be better off if UNESCO succeeded in its bid to single out Australia for what is, we all agree, a global problem. And that's why the World Heritage Committee unanimously struck out this year's attempt to use Australia only for its, call, for its global call to action. Mr President, with only 1.3 per cent of global emissions, Australia cannot fix this problem alone. The world must do more to reduce emissions, and the World Heritage Committee must find a path towards collective action and not singular punishment. 
The Morrison government's concern was that UNESCO sought an immediate in danger listing without appropriate consultation and without a site visit and without all the latest information. It's clear that this process has concerned not only Australia but other nations as well. So we welcome the support of an overwhelming majority of the Order. nations at the 44th Senator session Hume, time of the, for the World Heritage Committee. Expired. Senator Wish Wilson, a supplementary question. Minister, UNESCO didn't strike this out. It recommitted the vote to May 2022. Your government is now being watched closely by the world. There is specific language in the recent UNESCO ruling that requires Australia to demonstrate an acceleration on key points of the reef 2050 plans, including by lowering emissions that are killing the reef beyond current plans. What is your plan for accelerating emissions reduction, and how is giving money to new fossil fuel projects, including the gas-led recovery, going to accelerate emissions reductions? Order. Senator. Order. Senator Hume. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. Indeed, 19 of the 21 members of the World Heritage Committee support in spoke in support of Australia's position. The World Heritage Committee's endorsement of Australia's position will give reef managers, marine scientists and land managers the chance to demonstrate the success of the outstanding work that is taking place across the reef. We will invite representatives of UNESCO and the IUCN to visit the reef and see firsthand the work that we are doing to build the reef's resilience and submit a state party report to the World Heritage Centre by 1 February 2022. Order. We will continue to work with UNESCO and the World Heritage Committee to protect the long-term future of the reef. And we're working with the Queensland Government to ensure that the strategies under the Reef 2050 plan are delivering Order. the best possible outcomes for the reef. The Australian and Queensland governments are investing more than $3 billion from 2014-15 to 23-24 to implement the Reef 2050 plan, and more than $2 billion of this is from Order. the Australian Senator government. Hume. Senator Hume. Wilson, a final supplementary question. Minister, the world's best science provided by the IUCN to UNESCO tells us we all face a future where one of the world's most iconic and critical natural wonders may die in our lifetimes primarily from the burning of fossil fuels and a lack of ambition, global ambition, on climate change. Minister, can you today put your hand on your heart in the Senate and say you are happy with what your government is doing, everything possible to reduce emissions and protect the barrier reef for future generations? Senator Hume. Senator, that, Senator Wish Wilson, thank you very much for your question. Thank you, Mr President. Hand on heart, Australia is a good citizen in the World Heritage System, and we have implemented all previous recommendations. But what on earth corrective measure could we possibly implement on our own to address global warming? We are delivering on all of our outcomes that we have committed to in the Reef 2050 plan. That includes controlling outbreaks of the crown of flawn starfish that eats coral, improving water quality, doubling the on-ground joint field management program, addressing plastic solution, rehabilitating island, coastal and reef habitats. And in fact, as reported in the 2019 Reef Water Quality Report Card, we are over halfway to the fine sediment target and almost halfway to the dissolved inorganic nitrogen target. Mr President, can I reiterate that the Morrison government is deeply committed to protecting the World Heritage Listed Great Barrier Reef? Order, Senator Hume. Order. I'm going to ask senators the wearing of masks makes it particularly difficult to call senators to order because I can't see their mouths move. Uh, I, can, I can see, I can recognise some voices at the front of the chamber, but particularly at the rear of the chamber. Senator Macdonald. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Can the minister advise the Senate on the latest health measures to support closing the gap? The minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Thanks, Senator Macdonald, for the opportunity to outline these important measures. And I know that uh, Senator Macdonald takes a strong interest in closing the gap, particularly working with local communities in far north Queensland. Mr. President, to support the first Closing the Gap implementation plan, the Morrison government is investing more than $300 million in health infrastructure and programs to ensure Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders can access health services when and where they need them. The government is also investing $45 million to ensure the best start in life for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children through the Healthy Mums and Healthy Bubs program. 
This funding is an additional $82 million for the Connected Beginnings Program, which includes funding for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health services. These programs are focused on prom promoting healthy outcomes and healthy lifestyle choices for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women and their babies. This will provide mothers with improved access to health care, including access to antenatal care from their health providers and to provide support until their baby is one year old. These programs complement and build on the government's investment of more than $781.1 million in the 21-22 budget to prioritise Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health and ageing outcomes. Mr President, the Closing the Gap Implementation Plan sets a foundation for the Commonwealth's efforts over the next decade in achieving the targets in the National Agreement on Closing the Gap signed by all Australian governments in July of 2020. Senator Macdonald, a supplementary question. How is the Liberal and Nationals government supporting Indigenous Australians as part of the response to COVID-19? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Again, thanks, Senator Macdonald, for the question. Through the Commonwealth Government's $1 billion investment in new Closing the Gap measures, we're investing $254.4 million in infrastructure to better support the critical work of Aboriginal community controlled health organisations, which have been a significant part of the government's response to COVID-19. Operated by communities delivering comprehensive and culturally appropriate primary health care services, including administering COVID-19 vaccines across rural and remote Australia. Mr. President, we are absolutely committed to improving health services for Indigenous Australians, their families and their communities. Aboriginal community controlled health organisations have been vital in providing health support for Aboriginal communities across Australia. Senator Macdonald, a final supplementary question. What are the socio-economic targets related to the National Agreement on Closing the Gap? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. The new Aboriginal the new National Agreement on Closing the Gap was released in July last year and represents a significant shift in the Closing the Gap framework. 17 national socio-economic targets will track progress in improving life outcomes, including closing the gap in life expectancy within a generation by 2031, increasing the proportion of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander babies with a healthy birth weight to 91% by 2031, and significant and sustained reduction in suicide of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people towards zero. Mr President, the National Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Health Plan is underpinning action to, to drive progress against these targets with a combined national focus. The Closing the Gap Implementation Plan has been developed by ministers, departments and agencies across our nation, with peak Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island partners, particularly the Coalition of Peaks, representing around 50 community-controlled organisations. Time has expired. Senator Seawood, remotely. Thank you, Mr President. Mr President, my question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. If children between the age of 12 to 16 are not included in the government's vaccination targets, the whole of the population target is actually 65%, not 80%. If we reopen at 65%, our hospitals will be overwhelmed and we will have tens of thousands of cases. As Queensland's latest outbreak shows, kids can catch and transmit COVID. Why aren't you including children above the age of 12 in the vaccination program? How many children have to catch COVID before the government includes them in its vaccination targets? The minister representing the Minister for Health, um, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President, and thanks, Senator Seward, for the program. Um, Mr. President, children are, in fact, included, uh, as announced by the Health Minister on Monday, in the vaccination program. Uh, we commenced uh, with uh, children with certain health issues, Indigenous children in, and, and children in remote communities, uh, as a part of our vaccination program. Uh, and uh, the the Vaccination of availability 
uh, and approval for uh, ch uh, children uh, was only made by uh, the TGA uh, in recent times, Mr. President. And so uh, the, the health minister, in fact, did announce on Monday that children will become part of the vaccination program in the categories that I've outlined, Mr. President. Our objective is to offer all Australians for whom a vaccine has been approved the opportunity to have one as soon as possible. We want all of those over the age of, uh, of, uh, of 18 to be able to have the opportunity for a vaccine by the end of the year. Uh, and as I've said a number of times, and as the Health Minister and the Prime Minister and many of my colleagues have said, we'll continue to grow and develop the uh, vaccine program uh, with the availability of vaccine, opening up more opportunities for Australians to access the vaccine through more outlets, Mr. President. It's important that as many Australians as possible uh, get vaccinated. Uh, we've seen with the Delta variant, variant uh, how the how the COVID virus has has modified and changed its behaviour, and so it's important that we continue to adapt to the circumstances uh, as the the virus itself uh, adapts and, and creates more variants. So we'll continue, and, and the government will continue to do that, Mr. President. Senator Seawood, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Minister, the government is not including all children in the targets. They are not including, in fact, children over the age of, or between the age of 12 and 16 in their targets. Why isn't that occurring? Why have you only relied on the Doherty Institute for advice and not listened to other experts as well, such as the Grattan Institute and uh, other experts that are saying children need to be included in the targets, not just the program, and all children Order between Senator the age Seward. of 12 and 16? Senator Colbeck. Uh, thanks, Mr. President. And again, thanks, Senator Seward, for the question. Mr. President, the government commissioned the Doherty Institute to conduct research um, to provide us with advice on the parameters for opening up the economy. We have released that information uh, publicly so that all Australians can understand the circumstances under which the various stages of the process to open up the economy and open up the community can be undertaken. Uh, the Doherty Institute uh, modelling was based on the advice with respect to vaccinations uh, available uh, at the time. And Mr. President, and, and as I've just indicated, uh, children will progressively uh, become part of the vaccination rollout program. But the vaccination program rollout has always been based on a range of priorities. Uh, and those priorities have progressed as we've had availability of additional vaccines. Senator C, what a final supplementary question. Thank you. Minister, are you not including kids because there is not enough vaccine available? And do you concede that by not including children between the age of 12 and 16 in the targets, that this is a much more risky approach? Senator Colbeck. Mr. President, uh, thanks, Senator Seward, for the question. Uh, I've already indicated on a number of occasions that children will be part of the vaccine rollout. So, so I don't concede uh, what she's indicated as part of her question. Children uh, will be, and they already are being included as part of the vaccine rollout, Mr. President. They're not part of the targets. Order. Point of order, Senator Chair, Se Mr. No, President. I'm sorry, Senator C. We, 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 I think the rules of engagement under remote participation don't allow points of order to be made remotely. Someone here can do it, but um, Senator Colbeck to continue. Thank you, thank you Mr. President. Order. Uh, Senator Colbeck, to Mr. continue. Thank you, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, the, the government com uh, commissioned the Doherty Institute to undertake research to give us uh, and all of the community a, a, an indication of the parameters that might permit the community to open up uh, and, the co and the economy to open up. Uh, that information has been provided to all Australians so that they can understand the circumstances and the targets with which that might occur. Mr. President, we will continue Senator to Pratt. work to provide access to vaccines for all Australians 
uh, as approved Order. by the Senator TGA. Senator Colbeck, time has expired. Senator Brown. Uh, thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. I refer to the answer the Minister for Urban Infrastructure gave in the House yesterday about the Com Commuter Car Park Fund. Yesterday the, Prime Min Sorry, yesterday, the Minister claimed decisions were based on departmental advice, yet the Auditor-General found not that not one of the 47 car parks were recommended by the department. Today, Mr Morrison refused on nine occasions to say what involvement he had in deciding the car parks in target seats. At any point, did Mr Morrison or, or his office see the list of top, top 20 marginal seats used to distribute funds? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Colbeck. Oh, sorry, Senator Birmingham. <laughs> oh, thanks, um, uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, um, these are uh, valuable projects for communities around Australia that the Senator is asking questions about. Uh, they uh, they uh, do and will provide uh, benefit to uh, people in uh, in a range of different communities. Uh, as uh, as is well known, they were a subject of an ANO report and the department's accepted uh, the recommendations of that report and has begun to implement them. Have you concluded your answer, Senator Birmingham? Order. Order. Senator Brown, a supplementary question. Order. Senator Brown is on her feet. Order. Senator Brown. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr President. Evidence on the public record makes clear the Prime Minister's office was directly involved in deciding grants under the Community Sport Infrastructure Grants Program, revising projects on the infamous colour-coded spreadsheet. Can the Minister outline the role the Prime Minister's office played funding car parks for political gain? Senator Birmingham. Well, thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. Mr. President, uh, it's uh, it's not unusual for uh, for ministers, prime ministers, to be lobbied, to be engaged in relation uh, to needs in different communities uh, across the country. Uh, and, Mr. President, uh, I, I mean, I listen to those. I listen to those opposite. Who, of course, on once again, you know, they, they have their own version of history. You know, they fail to acknowledge the fact that Labor had its own $300 million park and ride fund, don't they? Order. Senator Wong on a point of order. Point of order, direct relevance. The question goes to, and the Prime Minister was asked nine times, did not answer. This minister did not answer. And we are asking in this chamber what role the Prime Minister or his office played in funding these car parks. On the point of order, um, the minister was in order until I think he strayed upon an alternative um, on, on alternative programs because I believe to be directly relevant. One needs to be relevant to the multiple programs that were mentioned in the question. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, thanks Mr President. Well the question goes to rank hypocrisy too in terms of the approach of those opposite. Uh, the Prime Minister certainly played no greater role than I suspect the member for Maribyrnong did in announcing 24 such projects. Senator Brown, a final supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Today, Senator today, Mr. Morrison claimed Australians had voted for his commuter car park fund, despite the majority of grants being approved before the election was called. This minister echoed those views recently on Insiders. Does this minister really expect Australians to accept the Morrison government using taxpayer money as Liberal Party money on the basis that rorts are okay if you're re-elected? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, thanks, Mr. President. Well, it seems it's okay for those on that side to, you know, to throw mud about something this side of politics does in relation to funding community infrastructure, uh, and they'll call that names. But when they were doing Order. exactly the same thing in the lead up to the last Order. election, when they were doing exactly the same thing, of course, Order it was valuable community left. infrastructure. It was okay Senators for the member Gallagher for Maribyrnong and Brown. to run around the country Order. announcing car Senator, parks Order. in different Senator locations. Birmingham, but it's not okay I'll for the coalition to, to do it. Your seat. Um, before you raise a point of order, Senator Wong, you would have heard me constantly called. I couldn't hear a word that was being said. Um, <laughs> well, you may have better hearing than I have. I couldn't hear a word as I was calling senators to order. Mr President, I understand the sensitivity this minister has in defending this, but he has now on three occasions avoided answering a question well, and Senator, resorted, Senator Wong, resorted Senator simply Wong, to going, going to about the— 
All right, well, Senator Wong, there was, I, I, I don't. With the, a, a critique of the content of an answer and whether someone asserts it is an answer or otherwise is not a matter for here. That goes to the content of an answer. Points of order are for direct, direct relevance. I could, genuinely could not hear a word of Senator Birmingham's quite loud voice as I was constantly calling senators to order. So, Senator Birmingham, to continue. Thank, thanks, thanks, Mr. President. Mis, Mr. President, I'm happy to come into this place and, uh, and answer uh, serious questions, well-intentioned questions. Uh, I'll deal with the fact that uh, uh, when questions come, of course, from people who hold a consistency in relation to their position. On this matter, I just find it so hypocritical, so amazing that those opposite— Order. Senator Wong, on a point of order? Point of order, direct relevance. This question goes to the expenditure of public monies. It is not, it is not directly relevant within the standing orders for him to simply talk about the Labor Party. Well, I'm not at this, I take that point, Senator Wong, and I ruled that point earlier, but as I've made previously too, a glancing comment um, as you rose to following the minister when the minister made a comment about the opposition at that point, while answering a question about his own comments that contains politically charged phrases in the question, I think an answer of that nature is not, is not out of order. I have, I have consistently ruled very tightly when questions are tight, factual questions, um, as I did earlier this week. This was not one of those, and the minister is entitled to defend his own record and statements in a manner he sees fit when they're contained in the question. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. Mr. President, I am simply pointing out the double standard. The coalition announced policy and commitments in relation to investing in community infrastructure in car parks. The Labor Party announced pre-election policy to invest in car Order, parks. Senator Birmingham, Each time of them for the would answer have been has expired. The time for the answer has expired. Senator McMahon. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the magnificent Minister for Regionalisation, Regional Communications and Regional Education. Order. Can the Minister advise the Senate on the specific regional education measures that will lift outcomes for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children to support. Okay, Senator Scar on a point of order, which is not common during point, the question. Point of order, Mr. President. There was a clear interjection from the Leader of the Opposition in relation to. Sorry? Order. I, Sorry? We could be here for quite a few weeks in a row. I'm going to ask senators in the first week to take a breath. So the leader of the opposition referred the leader of the opposition referred to my good friend Senator McKenzie as the rorting minister. I think the leader of the opposition should um, withdraw. I first I, I didn't hear it. Sec I, I didn't hear it, so I, I can't. What I'm going to do, that is not in the list of terms that I have traditionally ruled out of order. I will, although if the opposition could listen to me, I am going to seek some advice from the clerk about words that we've asked to withdraw before, and I will come back to the chamber if necessary and upon reviewing the Hansard. But I, I, but I will ask senators to restrain themselves. Um, I am not certain whether that term has been ruled unparliamentary before, but I will check. Um, I will also urge senators that can I ask senators to listen for a minute? Terms that are parliamentary when used in a general sense are sometimes unparliamentary when specifically directed at a person. That is what I will check about this term. Thank you, Senator Scar. Senator McMahon, can you, can you um, continue your question, please? Can you restart your question, please? Because I couldn't hear it. Yes, Mr President. Can the minister advise the Senate on the specific regional education measures that will lift outcomes for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children to support closing the gap. The Minister for Regionalisation, Senator McKenzie. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. I thank Senator McMahon for her question and for her strong representation of the Northern Territory. The Liberal and Nationals government knows that further effort is required to improve educational outcomes for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children in regional and remote Australia. Indigenous kids, particularly those from remote areas, are more likely to start school behind, with the gap growing throughout their schooling life. And if you start behind, it's incredibly hard to catch up. 
School attendance rates have not improved, and despite some improvements in literacy and numeracy, about one in four Indigenous students uh, in years five, seven and nine remain below the national minimum standards in reading. We want to turn that around. Since the national agreement was signed, the Commonwealth has taken concrete practical steps to establish partnerships with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people to develop solutions that work and enable shared decision-making processes. Everything we do under that agreement is in partnership, not just with uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders, but with states and territories. As announced by the PM today, we're investing $250 million to ensure all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children have a strong and positive start to their learning journey, to be able to access quality education that will assist closing the gap. Significant investment in evidence-based programs are lifting participation and improving literacy rates. $280 million to support improvements in leadership capability, professional development and student outcomes through city to country partnerships, getting high performing uh, metro schools partnering with Indigenous schools. Uh, Halebury, in my home uh, state, is partnering uh, with an Indigenous school in Darwin, and they're getting great improved increases because you can't be what you can't see. And for often for young people, it's learning from their peers. And that's seen a significant improvement in NAPLAN results uh, as a result of that partnership. We're also investing in Senator McMahon, a supplementary question. Thank you, Minister. And that is fantastic news for the Northern Territory. Can you tell me how will the Liberal and National Government's new measures support effective learning and education outcomes through the development of strong literacy skills. Senator McKenzie. We know that focusing on reading and literacy will help set up Indigenous students for the success in school years and beyond. We're backing what works by providing up to $25 million to scale up evidence-based programs that have already succeeded. We're putting $8 million to support the growth of make it, the program called Making Up Lost Time in Literacy. We're going to double the amount of schools that are are uh, going to be participating in that program. That is a program that focuses on a phonics-based approach to literacy skills, because not everybody uh, learns the same way. The government knows how important it is that teachers uh, who are engaged in uh, schools uh, with Indigenous students have the right skills and will provide $5 million to the Good to Great Schools in Australia program that supports better student learning outcomes by improving uh, teaching methods. And we're also going to provide additional funding to support the expansion of the Kimberley Schools project in the Pilbara region of uh, WA. Senator McMahon, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Can you tell me how will the government assist students in remote communities to access a quality secondary education? Senator McKenzie. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Well, we're not just investing in early childhood care and education, not just in schools, but for secondary, uh, we're wanting to make sure that parents and students have choice to determine what works best for them. In remote school communities, there can be few, if any, local sc secondary school options, and that's why often boarding or residential schools are an important option for so many uh, children in your home territory, Senator. The government will invest $75 million to help meet the cost of building three new boarding schools in remote Western Australia and the NT, and upgrades to a fourth in the Northern Territory. Indigenous children in regional and remote areas need to see the opportunities available to them. Together, Using the evidence, we can close the gap on Indigenous education outcomes for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander students. Senator Watt. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, my question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Yesterday, the Minister refused to say whether Mr Morrison agrees with Coalition Senator Rennick's use of social media to undermine a TGA-approved COVID vaccine, which his own government is encouraging Australians to take up. Does Mr Morrison agree with Senator Rennick? Yes or no? And if not, what action will he take? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. Well, Mr President, I can't say that I've, uh, that I've reviewed the specific comments of Senator Rennick, and, uh, and I won't always take Senator Watt's word for it. What, uh, what, uh, what I can confirm, Mr President, well and truly, is the government's very strong support for the vaccination rollout and very strong encouragement for all Australians 
to get vaccinated at the earliest opportunities, uh, for all Australians to heed the advice in relation to the Order. safety of vaccines and the efficacy of vaccines. The evidence that shows very clearly uh, that both vaccines available in Australia, the AstraZeneca vaccine and the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine, each of them reduce the rate of death uh, when somebody acquires COVID-19 uh, by some 92 uh, per cent and 90 per cent respectively. That is the prime abiding reason and incentive why anyone should get a vaccine. The number one incentive to get vaccinated in Australia because it could save your life. Order. Because it could Senator save the lives Birmingham, of your family members. Senator Watt on a point of order. Senator Watt. On relevance, the question is simply whether Mr Morrison agrees with Senator Rennick. I think, I, I think Senator Birmingham did address his familiarity or otherwise with that at, when he commenced the question, and I'm reluctant to rule out this material as not directly relevant given that he started with that point. Senator Birmingham. Senator Rennick. And, uh, and Senator and, Rennick uh, and Mr President, obviously it was the fact I was talking about the real incentives to get a vaccine that perhaps drew the point of order from Senator Watt, the real incentives to get a vaccine being the fact it will save your life, save the lives of your family members, save the lives of your fellow Australians. And you know what? Australians know that's the real reason to get a vaccine. They know that the real reason to get a vaccine is because of those life-saving properties. It's why Australians participate overwhelmingly in childhood vaccination programs. It's why Australians are turning out in record numbers to participate in this vaccination program. It's why demand is very strong. And that's why the Labor Party policy in relation to handing out $6 billion order. of cash Senator, is so horribly Senator misplaced. Senator Birmingham, Mr. Mr. Senator Wong on a point of order. Senator Wong. Mr President, the point of order is direct relevance. Uh, it is the case that there was reference to what, Mr. what Senator Rennick was doing, but the question goes to whether the Prime Minister agrees and, if not, what action he will take. Order. Senator Rennick, please. And, and so on the point of order, I, I, I believe Senator Birmingham addressed at the commencement of the answer his lack of intimate familiarity with the, quite the, the comments referred to by Senator Watt, alleged comments referred to by Senator Watt in his question. I will say, however, that while I, was, I made it clear I was reluctant to rule material about the vaccine rollout generally as being not directly relevant, I will say that I do not think commenting on opposition policies meets the direct relevant test. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. Now, you know, there was no direct quote in the question, so as I, uh, as I said at the outset, I've not seen whatever the comments that Senator Watt is referring to are. But I'm very clear. The Prime Minister is very clear. The government is very clear in our continuous advocacy around the science, the efficacy, and the encouragement of Australians to get vaccinated Order, as Senator they are doing Birmingham, in record time numbers. For the answers expired. Senator Watt, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. According to his social media, yesterday Coalition Member for Dawson, Mr George Christensen, told the Coalition Party Room, and I quote, we should not be mandating the wearing of masks and we should not be condoning lockdowns. Does Mr Morrison agree with Mr Christensen? And if Mr Morrison won't take action against Senator Rennick, will he take action against Mr Christensen? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr President. Well, the Prime Minister has already said he Order. doesn't agree. He's already said publicly he doesn't Order. agree. He's made that perfectly plain, Mr. President. Now, Mr. Now, now, Mr. President, I know that, that Senator Watt thinks there's some ability to run around with a muzzle or a gag or something to address uh, to address these sorts of comments. In the end, Order. we are, and you're the one who wants to keep highlighting these matters. We want to make sure what we highlight is firmly, squarely the health advice, Mr. President. That is precisely what we're doing. It's what we're doing in the communications campaigns this government pursues. Now, the member for Dawson's not seeking re-election at the next election. He'll say what he's saying. The government speaks very clearly from the Prime Minister, from the Health Minister, from all the ministers of the government, uh, from the officials of the Chief Medical Officer and otherwise, to very clearly encourage Australians to get vaccinated. And they're doing so in record numbers, Mr President. 42.4 per cent of all Australians over the age of 16 have now had their first dose, another record day, and we are going to Order, keep providing Senator them Birmingham. with the information Senator, and encourage what them to a keep final going. supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Coalition Senator Matt Canavan has criticised public health measures as, and I quote, doing much more damage to our love of liberty and our political system. That's the real threat to us now. Does Mr Morrison agree with Mr Canavan? And importantly, what action Order. will Mr Morrison take to ensure that his MPs back in the government's own public health message? 
Senator Birmingham. Well, thanks, Mr. President. And no, and indeed, in a debate in a debate only earlier today in this chamber, I responded to Senator, Senator Canavan, acknowledging that we did not agree in relation to some of those statements. So we have been very clear in that regard, Order, Mr. Senator President. Watt. I mean, Senator Watt wants to ask about whether or not people agree. I'd love to know whether they all agree with Mr. Albanese's policy, because he didn't go to shadow cabinet apparently. So apparently they didn't get a chance to say in their senior levels, Order. in their executive levels, whether they agree. I can assure you, Mr. President, every member of the cabinet of this government Order, agrees Senator with our Gallagher. approach. Um, Order. Mr. Mr. President, he's order. Order. I've got Senator Gallagher on her feet with a point of order. Mr. On my right, Senator Mr. Wong. Mr. President, I, I can't see on my right who's interjecting, but please cease. Senator Rennick, I can see you. Senator Gallagher. Point of order, uh, Mr. President. On direct relevance, um, the minister is ignoring your the guidance you've provided and previous rulings on commenting on opposition policy. I, I, I think by the time you had raised, the minister had moved on from that what I glancing phrase. But I, I, I take the point, um, and I think the minister has taken the point. He sounded like he had moved on. Senator Birmingham. Indeed, Mr President, as I, as I was saying, to finish the sentence I was in, every cabinet minister in our government stands very clearly for the policies of getting this rollout delivered. Our policies are consulted through the Cabinet. They go through the Cabinet and we stand by them. And the fact is that the vaccine rollout is seeing high and growing demand across Australia. That high demand and growing demand is something that we will continue Order. to encourage. Birmingham, Australians are responding to that message and we thank— Order. Senator O'Sullivan. Senator Rennick. Senator O'Sullivan. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Employment, Workforce, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Can the Minister advise the Senate how the Liberal and Nationals government is supporting Indigenous Australians to upskill and gain employment opportunities to support closing the gap? Minister representing the Minister for Employment, Workforce, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr. President, and I thank Senator O'Sullivan for the question. And can I just acknowledge? Uh, Senator O'Sullivan's previous role uh, in working with the Mindaroo Foundation in particular, uh, but his dedication to ensuring that um, Indigenous people were given every opportunity to get a job. Senator O'Sullivan clearly understands the benefits of upskilling, of reskilling, uh, to ensure that people are equipped with what they need, those necessary skills, to move into employment. Mr. President, today's release of the Closing the Gap Implementation Plan uh, it was well and truly an important moment for our nation, but it also shows the important work that all partners of this historic agreement are doing to improve the lives of Indigenous Australians. In the 2021-22 budget, the Morrison government delivered funding for substantial reforms to help Indigenous Australians get into quality and long-lasting jobs both now and into the future. That is why we're delivering a $243.6 million new Indigenous skills and jobs advancement package. This is all about improving the economic, the social and the educational outcomes for Indigenous Australians. What this investment, Mr President, includes is around $42.8 million per annum. This will then grow to $60 million per annum in future years to the Indigenous Advancement Strategy for a new skills and employment program. Mr President, the program will build on the most successful elements of the current Indigenous-specific employment programs and focus, so importantly, on upskilling Indigenous Australians for in-demand jobs, we want them to get into work, but also putting in pl place those mechanisms to support them Order, Senator into Cash. Senator employment. Senator O'Sullivan, a supplementary question. Mr President, I thank the minister for that answer. Can I also ask, how is the government investing in pilot programs to help Indigenous Australians looking for work? Senator Cash. Again, and I thank Senator O'Sullivan for the question. And, uh, Mr President, we know that continue to closing the gap, and obviously we are all committed to closing the gap, but also to empowering Indigenous Australians. We need to work together. 
with all sectors of the community, with all, all levels of government, uh, to improve opportunities. In the 2021 budget, again, the Morrison government committed to investing in pilot programs to ensure that employment services aligned with the changing job market, and in particular, as we know, COVID-19 has impacted on that job market, but in particular, the changing job market in remote Australia, in order to meet the unique needs of job seekers in remote communities. The new pilots will commence in a number of locations by the end of 2021, following, so importantly, a co-design process. Then we will progressively roll out the program Order, Cash. in 2020. Senator O'Sullivan, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. How is the government investing into Indigenous Australian-run businesses, in, particularly in primary industry, to grow and prosper? Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr. President. And again, as part of our plan, in particular, you know, to assist us in securing Australia's recovery, but also to continue to meet the closing the gap employment targets, we are prioritising funding from the Indigenous Advancement Strategy to support economic growth, but also to ensure that we are providing jobs on country. Through the 2021-22 budget. We're delivering $10 million over the next two years to support Indigenous businesses and community organisations involved in the primary industry and land management sector to grow, to prosper and to create more jobs, in particular for Indigenous Australians. By supporting Indigenous businesses, we're working together to improve employment, economic development and social participation. Again, Mr President, we know that to continue to closing the gap, to continue to empower Indigenous Australians, we need to work together with all sectors Order, of government. Senator Cash, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. Mr. President, I ask that further questions be placed on notice. I'm going to uh, ask Senator Wong to withdraw the interjection directed at Senator McKenzie. So I withdraw, Mr. President. I understand. Can I get guidance on your ruling that yes. if we say the government are orders, that is not to be withdrawn, but if I say Senator McKenzie is a rorter, that is to be withdrawn. Thank is you. That, yes, is Senator. That correct? While if I could just read something to the chamber for in response to that query, while and this has been provided previously to um, others who have requested similar advice, while the word "rort" is not itself unparliamentary, an allegation that a senator rorted a program would be considered out of order in Senate proceedings on the basis of the prohibition in Standing Order 1933 against imputations of improper motives and personal reflections made against senators and members. So going to the point I made to Senator Scar, it is when it is directed in a personal nature. Thanks, senators. Are there any motions to take note of answers? Senator Watt. There are, Madam Deputy President. I rise to take note of the answers given by Senators Colbeck and Birmingham uh, to the questions asked by Senator Keneally and I. Now, we all know that Australia and the world is currently in the grip of the worst pandemic we have seen in the world for decades. Australians are being asked to make huge sacrifices right now uh, particularly those in lockdown areas in Sydney and South East Queensland, but also the millions of other Australians who are suffering economic, uh, mental health and other harm uh, as a result of the pan pandemic and the government's failure to do its job with vaccines and quarantine. But despite the fact that Australians are making huge sacrifices, day after day, night after night, we see members of this government running active disinformation campaigns on various social media platforms. The chief offenders, of course, are the member for Dawson, Mr Christensen, and two senators in this chamber, Senator Canavan and Senator Rennick, day after day, night after night, spreading anti-science, anti-mask, anti-lockdown, uh, all sorts of disinformation designed to confuse Australians, to make them doubt the science, to make them doubt the public health uh, orders uh, and advice that is being given, and they do this completely unrestrained by any member of their own government. Now, earlier this year, uh, this government encouraged the private sector to bring in place a, a voluntary code of conduct around disinf disinformation on social media. 
But day after day, night after night, we see members of this government actively promoting disinformation about COVID on a range of social media platforms. And they do this without any action being taken by their own government, which not only has a code of conduct about disinformation in social media, but is out there every day uh, uh, encouraging and arguing to Australians that we all do the right thing because we are all in this together. Now, we quoted a couple of examples uh, in question time both today and yesterday of Senator Rennick uh, sharing articles that undermine TGA-approved COVID vaccines, vaccines which his own government is encouraging Australians to take up. Mr Christensen uh, is promoting uh, views uh, and, and arguing in, in social media that we should not be mandating the wearing of masks, we shouldn't be condoning lockdowns, and again, day after day, we see Senator Canavan on social media arguing that we should, quote, end the lockdowns, amongst many other things. Uh, now, when these are put to uh, Senator Birmingham, representing the Prime Minister, uh, and he is asked uh, what action the government will take, that is the one question that Senator Birmingham will not answer, because the truth is that neither he nor the Prime Minister, nor for that matter any member of this government, will take any action against their rogue backbenchers who are out there running an active disinformation campaign in the Australian public, designed to confuse people, designed to make people doubt the public health advice that is being given, uh, uh, designed Watt, to please, run against their own Senator policies. Watt, please resume your seat. Senator Rennick. Uh, Madam uh, Deputy Chair, could Senator Watt please point out what the actual information I said is actually disinformation, be more specific, uh, rather than you, just Senator casting Rennick. general aspersions? Senator Rennick, uh, points of order need to be around the standing orders. That's the debating point. Thank you. Senator Watt. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. And I've already done that only about 30 seconds ago, if Senator Rennick would care to look back at it. So three times today, Senator Birmingham was asked what action the Prime Minister would take uh, about the disinformation cam that is, campaign that has been running, been run by three members of this government, uh, and three times he wouldn't answer that question, and that is because this government is not going to take any action uh, against any of their members who are out there running disinformation about COVID. How can we expect Australians to do the right thing? and to follow the public health advice that this government is actually encouraging them to follow when the government's own members of parliament are out there spreading anti-mask, anti-lockdown, anti-science, anti-vaccine views day after day after day with complete impunity, with a complete lack of action uh, from anyone in this government. So it's OK for Mr Morrison and other ministers to be out there encouraging, ordering, demanding Australians to do the right thing, but they do nothing about the fact that their own government members are out there encouraging Australians to do exactly the opposite. Why won't this Prime Minister act on his rogue backbenches? There are only two possible reasons. One is that he is too scared that they will withdraw support for his government and that they won't vote for the government's actions and he's not prepared to, prepared to stand up for them. Or the other reason, which is probably worse, is that this is a deliberate strategy from this government to court far-right extremist conspiracist views while attempting to uh, uh, position themselves thank in the middle you, ground. Senator it's White, a disgrace. Your time has expired. Senator Davey. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Deputy President. Uh, I think it's quite remarkable for um, Senator Watt to stand up here and talk about um, a handful of uh, examples of people who uh, are spreading misinformation, disinformation. These people are backbenchers, uh, and you know, whereas from Senator Watt's own state, their own chief health officer has been one of the keys to turning people off vaccinations. Jeanette Young saying she would rather see 18-year-olds get COVID, this age group that is now recognised as being super spreaders because they get minimal symptoms, they are active and they work and they need to work, but they're out there. She's telling them she'd rather see them get COVID than get AstraZeneca. I mean, that is just the example of you want to address misinformation, how about look in your own team as well? And uh, for Labor to get up here today, let's just think for a minute. What else has happened today? I mean, I'm not focused on what uh, 
Mr Christensen member for Dawson is putting on his social media. I'm not focused on what Senator Rennick is putting on his social media. No, no one is. So why are you concerned, Senator Watt? Why are you concerned? What I am more interested in, what else has happened today? We had a significant closing the gap statement this morning. But Labor are more concerned about trying to score cheap political points on vaccin vaccination and rollout than actually focus on something significant, something that means a lot to a significant portion of our population. Maybe it's because Labor are concerned that even though they initiated the closing the gap process, which is welcome, which is a great process, born of the best intentions, but to date it hasn't been achieving our goals. That is why our government brought together a new 10-year agreement signed by all Australian governments. So it is not just the purview of the Commonwealth. The Coalition of Peaks and the Australian Local Government Association are also involved, and over 50 Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander organisations have been involved in the process. Finally, instead of a top-down approach, we are actually involving the people most impacted by this vital policy area. But because Labor only, they only care about vaccinations today, well, let's talk about the vaccination of the Indigenous population on this remarkable day. As at 4th of August, we have vaccinated over 146,000 people who identify as Aboriginal and or Torres Strait Islanders. They've received at least one dose. That's 25 per cent of the eligible uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander population aged 16 and over. 11 per cent of their population have received a second dose. And now this is quite an achievement when you consider that earlier on in the vaccination rollout, this population was one of the most vaccine hesitant populations. I commend the efforts of the Aboriginal health uh, services that have gone to great lengths to educate and communicate with their communities and get these vaccinations into their arms. I commend the work of the Royal Flying Doctor Services, who have been out and about in 88 of our most remote communities and have delivered nearly 10,000 doses of vaccination. I, I, I come back to, however, the overall health overview for our Ab Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, because this is a very important part to close the gap. We know that our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have worse health outcomes. But our closing the gap statement today is supported by more than one billion in targeted investment to close the gap across multiple areas, but including nearly 300 million for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health services. So, you know, let's focus on what matters. Let's focus on what's real. Let's stop focusing on backbencher social media and start focusing on what matters. Thank you. Thank you Senator Davies. Senator Carr. Sure, Madam Deputy President, the pandemic, of course, is one of the great crises that's been facing our society, and I think it, internationally it's reshaping the way in which we live. And so, for the day when the minister Colback indicated that the government acknowledged that it had challenges in terms of its capacity to provide sufficient supply for what it acknowledges itself as being the key to finding solutions to this pandemic in terms of supply and the logistics of the vaccines, I think he's underestimating the difficulties that the government has brought on itself. It strikes me that the government has mismanaged this crisis at every level. From the very beginning of the crisis, the government has sought effectively to present this as a political challenge to take advantage, political advantage 
and has sought to play favourites with the states. It has sought to uh, underestimate the capacity of Australians to deal with the truth in regard to this matter, it has failed to acknowledge the importance of our own manufacturing capacity, it has failed to deal with it in any real way that uh, or any understanding of the international questions when it comes to the pharmaceutical industry, it has failed to come to grips with the basic questions in terms of um, the major health crisis faced with this, uh, with this uh, pandemic. In fact, we had this protracted debate about whether or not we should concentrate on the economics of uh, the country versus the health of the country, and it was played out through the government's attempt to blame one state over another and, of course, to try to uh, fail to deal with, I think, uh, the personalities involved with this matter. I'm particularly concerned um, that we have not been able to develop our own manufacturing capacity. While I acknowledge how important it is for AstraZeneca, for instance, to be able to make vaccines in Australia, I find it extraordinary that the government is not able to even provide us with the most basic information on the supply contracts that are engaged with that matter, claiming, of course, that it says national security is involved. Now, when the uh, ABC sought under Freedom of Information details of a supply contract uh, for AstraZeneca, they were told that such uh, provision of uh, such contracts would prevent a major risk to the national security of the country, despite the fact that the European Union, the United Kingdom, the United States, Mexico, Brazil have taken an entirely different approach to the provision of basic public information about those supply contracts. And so we, it doesn't excuse the failure of the government to deal with the fundamentals in terms of not being able to provide sufficient vaccines for the people of this country. We saw, for instance, their lap, the sedasial attitude to the provision of different types of vaccines, the uh, catastrophe that emerged around the uh, provision of the Pfizer vaccines, where we saw the minister's attempt to duck and weave about his direct engagement with Pfizer, where industry sources indicated that he, rather than his uh, believing it, as he tried to imply, that there was just a matter for low-level public servants who were the bunglers in regard to the contract arrangements, that industry sources have highlighted through the ABC that the minister himself had been rude, dismissive and penny-pinching when it came to dealing with the senior management of Pfizer. We saw with the R&D, Global R&D, uh, former R uh, president of the Global R&D, John uh, Lamantina from Pfizer, under underscored this point about how unfortunate it was that Australia had failed to secure the necessary supplies of the Pfizer vaccine because of the failure, the failure of the government to understand basic elements of supply chains and basic elements of how the pharmaceutical industry actually worked globally and made worse by the minister's direct assault upon individuals within that company. Now, I find it extraordinary that the government has tried to duck and weave and not able to even deal with basic issues around the mRNA vaccine production facilities when it should have been able to move much more quickly and to be able to deal with these fundamental questions. Now, it's not too late. It's not, uh, it is, of course, still time for us to be able to develop the necessary sovereign capability to ensure that we can protect this country and we can ensure that the people of this country can enjoy the benefits of modern science and modern manufacturing processes. Thank you, Senator Carr. Your time has expired. Senator Small. Thanks, Madam Deputy President. And uh, whilst Senator Watts had a lot to say about potential misinformation today, it's not the first time. Uh, that Senator Watt has focused on this. Indeed, in uh, estimates only two months ago, the Senator was giving air to an article, and I quote, which refers to a public health English blueprint study in the UK that found both AstraZeneca and Pfizer vaccines were only 33 per cent effective against the Indian variant three weeks after the first dose. So at the same time as this government was getting on with the business of rolling out the vaccine, of protecting lives and livelihoods, Senator Watt was scaremongering and undermining the effectiveness of our vaccine rollout in this parliament. Professor Kelly goes on to say, uh, in response to Senator Watt, 
that she's actually read the article, and she is always wary of preprint articles. A preprint article means it is not going through the usual peer review processes that is required. We found all through the COVID-19 pandemic that many of those articles have proven to be false. So when it comes to uh, talking, in fact lecturing, this chamber about spreading misinformation, Madam Deputy President, I won't take it from Senator Watt. On the very real questions of sovereign vaccine manufacturing that Senator Carr raises today, this is a government that has a story to tell of which all Australians can rightfully be proud. Not only was Australia the first country in the world to close its international borders at the onset of the pandemic, but Australia took the decision in August of 2020 to ensure we had sovereign vaccine manufacturing capability in this nation. It's worth noting that mRNA vaccines had never received widespread approval for use in humans before COVID-19 uh, was affecting the world in 2020. mRNA vaccines are at the cutting edge of medical science, and Australia has, in fact, uh, asked for proposals from local manufacturers to ensure that we develop this capability here in Australia. Other nations have done the same. Singapore, for instance, uh, has started uh, the process of developing mRNA vaccine manufacturing capability and expects it to be up and running in 2023. So whilst we've received a dozen proposals which are in the process of being assessed, the best advice that the government has is that it's between one and three years from concluding that sort of arrangement to the vaccine manufacturing capability being a reality. So far from the lies and misinformation that we hear from those opposite, seeking to scare and frighten the Australian people at a time when they are seeking to do the right thing by themselves, to do the right things by their loved ones and to do the right thing by their nation, to roll up their sleeves and go and get vaccinated, as we're seeing in record numbers. Just yesterday, uh, yet again, a new record of almost 214,000 vaccines in arms in Australia right now. And that was without trying to bribe them, as the Labor Party have sought to do, showing that they've learnt nothing from their previous errors in government, where we saw cash for clunkers, we saw pink bats, we saw school halls, we saw checks to dead people. No, they've learnt nothing from that. They've learnt nothing from eight years on the opposition benches. But in trying to bribe the Australian people to do what they are doing in overwhelming numbers, they have showed they have learned nothing from their previous mistakes and that they are not fit to sit on the government benches in this parliament. The PM has acknowledged the challenges that we have faced in an unprecedented vaccine uh, rollout, the first time the nation has had to confront such a challenge. It is testament, uh, therefore, that we have a great story to tell, having protected lives and livelihoods, a death rate uh, that is uh, the second lowest in the OECD. And in fact, if we had the OECD average mortality rate, some 30,000 additional Australians who are currently here would not be alive. That is the cold, hard fact of the success of this government in protecting lives and livelihoods throughout the, the pandemic. And in the face of the misinformation, the lies and the scaremongering from the Labor Party, we will remain resolute in continuing to deliver for Australians. Thank you, Senator Small. I believe we've got Senator Sheldon by remote. Yes, Senator. Thank you, uh, Deputy President. I want to speak um, into question, to questions uh, that were put to Senator Colbeck and the answers he gave. I want to speak out the support of pharmacists who New South Wales, particularly in southwest Sydney, who are pleading for support from the Morrison government. They're struggling to grapple with the Morrison government's failed vaccine rollout. Now, today marked yet another record high of cases and deaths in the Sydney COVID-19 outbreak. 262 new cases and very tragically, five deaths. We desperately need to increase vaccination rates in hotspot areas. Yet the Sydney Morning Herald reported only today that the vaccine rollout through pharmacies in New South Wales has fallen desperately behind. 
in April, 1,250 pharmacies in New South Wales were authorised to administer AstraZeneca vaccines. Yet here we are in August, and only 314 pharmacies in this state are now putting jabs into arms. 314 pharmacies out of 1,250 authorised. That is just 25%. Because yeah, why? Because they, because yeah, why haven't they been able to get the vaccine? Uh, you put the shots in the arms because the vaccines aren't there. They haven't turned around. And the government did not prepare itself for this particular um, pandemic, as we've had opportunities during this year to do it, and during last year, and almost uh, uh, for two years now. Now the prime minister failed to secure an adequate supply of different vaccines. Prime minister failed to set up an adequate national quarantine system. And now the Prime Minister has failed to establish an adequate vaccination scheme through our network of pharmacies. So what's happened? The Pharmacy Guild of Australia, New South Wales branch, pins the blame on the federal government rollout plans. There is an existing community service obligation wholesaler network with established cold chain lines, which ensure the delivery of essential medicines around Australia within just 24 hours. This existing system was entirely suitable to manage the rollout of COVID-19 pharmacies, vaccines to pharmacies. Now, the Pharmacy Guild says this would have fast track the rollout rather than enable pharmacies, would have enabled pharmacies to access COVID-19 vaccines through this established system. The Morrison government set up an entirely new parallel system. And now we have a situation where only 25% of authorised pharmacies are receiving vaccines. And even those few pharmacies fortunate enough to receive vaccines are suffering lengthy delays. Pharmacist, pharmacist Mario Baroni, in doing the brave and essential work of vaccinating Australians in Fairfield, the epicentre of the current outbreak, he said it's taking more than two weeks for his AstraZeneca orders to arrive. It is communities in Fairfield, in Canterbury Bankstown, in Liverpool, and other parts of West and Southwest Sydney that have borne the brunt of this outbreak. Some of the most marginalised and disadvantaged communities in Sydney. And they are being hit hardest by the failure of the Prime Minister's rollout. Southwest Sydney has the lowest rate of full vaccination in Sydney at just 14.6%. Out of Southwest Sydney is just 17.8%. And the outer west, um, southwest, um, is 17.8%, uh, and the outer west is just 17.9%. It is the wealthiest enclaves of Sydney where vaccination rates are highest, and the eastern and northern suburbs where rates are as high as 26.9%. While hardworking middle class Australians are yet to get, be, being, uh, and are being left be, yet to get again being left behind by this government. I want to quote another pharmacist, Paul Macquarie-based Judy Blunkett. Uh, Judy, uh, Ms Plunkett uh, said that who is yet to receive a single vaccine dose, and she said, I quote, it has been singularly the most frustrating thing in all of our lives for the past six months. If pharmacies were brought on in April, we could have done tens of thousands of doses by now. Every barrier has been put in front of us. Australians are sick of this government putting barriers up. It's about time the Morrison government took responsibility and gave them a helping hand. You know, they should be looking at a whole Thank series you, of initiatives. Thank you, Senator Sheldon. Your time has expired. So the question is, the motion is moved by Senator Watt to take note of answers be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Wish Wilson. Deputy President, I rise to take note of answers provided uh, uh, by the Minister representing the Minister for the Environment, uh, Susan, lay, lay off the roof. Um, um, Senator Wish Wilson, please refer to. Susan Lay. Thank you. Deputy President, um, I think in uh, my, my tenth year here in this chamber, I can honestly say, and I can put my hand on my heart just like the Minister did today and say that of all the cynical, you know, unfathomable, you know, unconscionable things that I've seen in this place, 
by this government. The Environment Minister, in the middle of a worsening pandemic, at taxpayers' expense, flying around the world to lobby the 21-member nation of UNESCO's World Heritage Committee to vote against the science provided by the IUCN Scientific Committee to that UNESCO committee that they should list the Great Barrier Reef in danger because climate change primarily, along with deteriorating water quality, threatens the world heritage values of that property. None of us in here can dodge the fact that the reef, especially in the last 10 years, has suffered catastrophic decline. Four mass coral bleachings in the last decade, when coral bleachings caused by warming oceans, caused by burning fossil fuels, haven't occurred in history until 1998. In any of the records that we have, there's been no, no incidences of these mass coral bleachings. Our best climate science models in this decade predicted it wasn't possible to get back-to-back -back bleachings of the Barrier Reef till 2050 based on emissions targets. Yet that's exactly what we got in 2016 and 2017. And while you deny that the reef is in danger, while you fail to act, while you prosecute a political pathway to deny, then you will fail to act. That's what this is about, Acting Deputy President. The, the only thing I could get out of the minister today was that somehow this salvaged Australia's reputation. This is not about Australia's reputation. This is about the future of the Barrier Reef and the UNESCO World Heritage Committee sending the strongest possible signal that the global community, not just Australia, but the global community needs to act on reducing emissions, at least in line with the Paris Agreement. I couldn't think of a stronger possible siren call to action than for the Barrier Reef, the world's greatest natural wonder, to be listed in danger because of climate change. The Minister, Minister Lay has also in recent weeks said in a series of interviews that somehow her reason for lobbying against the World Heritage in Danger listing was to stop scientists from becoming depressed. Well, what a load of rot. I can tell you many good scientists are thoroughly depressed at what they have seen unfold before their eyes in the last decade on the Great Barrier Reef. They've devoted their life to studying and promoting the health of the reef, and they are witnessing its decline. And they are witnessing this government promoting fossil fuels, giving public money to new fossil fuel projects, to Adani, to Beedaloo, to new fossil fuel power stations. They've witnessed 80,000 kilometres, square kilometres of our oceans being handed to fossil fuel companies to go out and explore for the next fossil fuel bonanza in a time of climate emergency. They have witnessed this. What could depress those scientists more than seeing a government in denial, a government deliberately peddling the interests of fossil fuel companies that, by the way, donate to this government and keep them in business? How cynical is that? She also said it was offensive to the reputation of First Australians. How, in, how the hell is this offensive to the reputation of First Australians? They're watching what we are doing in our lifetime, in our colonial world, what we have done to the reef in just a very short period of time, after spending 40 to 60,000 years living in harmony with a barrier reef and its thousands of kilometres of ecosystems. I can't believe the Australian people are that stupid that they would buy the arguments of this environment minister, who has lobbied against climate action and lobbied directly for climate denial, lobbied to cover up the truth of the Great Barrier Reef. The only thing that will save the reef is the truth and action, because we have no choice. This is not the last you'll hear of this president. The committee will be Thank revisiting you, this Wilson. next year. Your time has expired. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Wish Wilson to take note of answers be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Um, that concludes taking note. We'll now move.